We're all waiting for about one or two more minutes till we uh, go live. <laughs> Hope you guys are all doing okay. All right, good morning, folks. Good to have you here this morning. And uh, we wanted to start off with a couple of announcements before we uh, carried on too much further. Uh, the registering uh, for the church service is something that is ongoing. It's something that uh, you have to keep doing on a week-by-week -week basis. You can't just sort of roll from one week to the next. You have to phone in or else uh, go online to register each week. That way we're, we're making sure that we're not above that 30% of capacity. Now, we still have plenty of room for other people here. I think we have room for about 130 people altogether, 125, 130. Uh, but uh, just uh, please uh, continue to register online or phone in on Tuesday mornings uh, between 9 and noon, and someone can register you online in your place. If you don't have a computer or that, then you'd be able to uh, register that way. Please also uh, try and keep, uh, keep track of the safety protocols that have been put into place. And uh, they're on the screen. You saw them as you were walking up the hall here this morning as well. Just wearing, a make, wearing the face mask at all times till at least you get into the auditorium. Get your six foot distance around uh, from anyone else. And uh, if you feel more comfortable continuing to wear it, please do so. Uh, because I'm on the platform and I'm at least uh, three, five meters away from the closest person, then, uh, then I do not have to wear a mask once I'm up here myself. Uh, just as an incidental thing as well, you may see that there's not any other pastor that's here on the Sunday mornings, and uh, that's intentional. Uh, Pastor Jeremy, Pastor Lars uh, do not come on Sunday morning uh, when I'm preaching, and I don't come when they're preaching, either them are preaching, and uh, it's not because we don't like their preaching or they don't like mine. What it is is that, uh, is that if there was somebody that ended up having COVID, uh, during the course of this coming week, we found out that means all three pastors aren't out of commission then. You still have somebody that's going to be able to be here. And uh, so the one pastor that's here, the other two are home. And uh, if someone was to come down with COVID during this week and I couldn't come back to preach, then all the preaching's on the other two guys and uh, for the rest of the time. But uh, that's the reason that you don't see more than one pastor uh, here on a Sunday morning. Uh, we had originally planned for a business meeting to be happening after the morning service today. That has been adjusted. It's going to be next Sunday. All people who are members of the church have received an email. And uh, if you are a member of the church and did not receive an email, please let us know. We'll make sure that you get one. And what it is, it's outlining the agenda of what is going to be going on. Uh, we're going to be voting on some members, people who want to become members, and uh, we'll be voting on them. They've already been interviewed. Uh, now they have to be voted on by the congregation. But then the other thing that we're going to be voting on is, uh, is a, a CBA principal. And uh, there had been a question that came in during the course of the week. Um, if we can go to the next slide there with the, uh, about the principal. They said, where did he get his doctorate? It's Doug Osborne that we are going to be voting on. He has taught here in the past. Uh, he grew up here at the church. Uh, but uh, they said, where did he get his doctorate? Well, it came from Liberty University, and it was a doctor of education, educational leadership. That's a mouthful. 
So he's uh, gotten his doctorate there. He's got a BTH as well. He's got a Master's of Science. Uh, he has gotten uh, his, his more, to, more letters after his name than I have in my name. It's, uh, it's uh, something that we'll be voting on next week. So please, if you do have questions, uh, feel free to give a call into the church. We'll try and answer the questions during the week if we can and uh, bring them up on the Sunday morning so that if there are others who have the same question, we will be able to uh, answer that ahead of time. And then I think the, uh, the last thing that we're going to announce is just about the, uh, the free at-home online vacation Bible school. Uh, most churches, all churches, I guess, have gone this road if they're going to continue to have a VBS program. And uh, you can register your kids ahead of time. We want you to do that. It's from August 10 to 14. It's about a half, uh, is it a half day or a half hour program? It must be a half day program. And... Um, uh, you can look it up, you can get more information through the church website, register online as well, and uh, that way people will, they'll be able to know ahead of time. There are lots of things that have already been planned, lots of planning that's gone into this so that it will be as, uh, as good a program as possible in this uh, special circumstance that we're finding ourselves in right now. Okay, those really are all the announcements we need to give right now. I wonder if you wouldn't mind bowing your heads in prayer with me just for a moment. Father, we are thankful for the things that you have allowed us to go through. We're thankful, Father, for the people that are able to be here and those, Father, who are watching from home or on their phone or tablet or their computer, perhaps uh, here in town, perhaps different towns or cities, perhaps different places around the world. We don't know. But I pray, Lord, that you would just bring blessing into each of our lives, but also through each of our lives into the lives of other people. We thank you, Father, that uh, our own area here has not been hit more by this, by this pandemic than it already has. And even though there are cases, we pray for them, certainly, Lord. We pray, Father, for those who have come down with some of the symptoms. We pray, Lord, for those who are in the hospital or at home recovering. We pray, God, that you would uh, bring encouragement to them and that perhaps even through this pandemic that we all find ourselves in worldwide, uh, that, God, you may be able to become closer to people. People's hearts might be opened up to you more than perhaps they would have ever been in the past. And I pray, God, that your, your work would be done. Your Holy Spirit would be able to continue on, Father, working in people's lives in a special way now because of this pandemic. Pray for our country, Lord, that the decisions that will be made, that have already been made, will be ones that, even though they have far-reaching effects into the future, nevertheless, they will be beneficial for us as Canadians in the near future and the distant future as well. I pray, God, for those who are not well right now that uh, we've mentioned in the past. I think of Roz Cole. She was in the hospital for weeks through this serious back surgery. Now she's home. She's recovering. She's taking physio at home. We're thankful for that. I pray, God, for Pastor Marsaw as he's been in the hospital as well, having a hip replaced. And uh, as he continues in Brantford Hospital, that, uh, Lord, you would help with the therapy he's taking so that he will be able to get better as the time goes on and that he would be able to be back home soon. I thank you, Lord, for Ruth Greenslade, a missionary of many years with her husband down in South America. And I pray, God, that you would be working within her. Help her, Lord, with some of the asthmatic symptoms that she's been going through and that she continues still in the hospital down at Brantford. And I pray, God, for her. Bring encouragement and comfort to her. I pray, God, for Frida Brawatsky. She's been in the hospital for so long now. She's, uh, she's suffering from dementia. She's over at Willett now, uh, waiting for placement into a nursing home. But I pray, God, that you can bring a calmness of mind and heart to her as well. And then, Lord, I pray for John Haynes. Uh, Father, this is uh, Brenda Kerr, Brenda and John Kerr's uh, brother and uh, the son of uh, Ruth. And I pray, Lord, for John. He's been uh, difficult, had di having difficulty with health problems for so many years. And uh, Lord, he is at John Noble home. Uh, he's now been moved into palliative care. And I pray, God, for the family. Even though they know that this time has been coming and that the difficulties are there, nevertheless, they are assured of his, uh, his simple faith in you. And that, Lord, he will one day and expectedly soon will be in your presence. So I pray, Lord, for the care family. And I pray, God, for, for, uh, for Ruth Haynes as well as she sees her son going through this. And I pray now, Lord, for us, our church service, that, uh, God, you would help us as we, as we are looking to you for encouragement. We're looking to you, Father, for, uh, for your Holy Spirit to be able to work in our lives the way that you want to. And that, Father, when we leave this service or when we see the conclusion of this service online, 
that, uh, Lord, your Holy Spirit will be able to work within our hearts during the course of this week. For I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, now is when we usually sing a song or two, but we're not doing that these days. And uh, although later on in my message I do have a song that I'm going to read because we can't really be singing it, but uh, let's, uh, let's, just, uh, let's just look to some of the things that I hope can be an encouragement to you over the course of this uh, next uh, few minutes that we have together. Mrs. Paul is the choir director of Westside, or was the choir director of Westside Baptist Church in, in uh, Beatrice, I think it was, Beatrice, Nebraska. Her daughter Marilyn was the, was the piano player, she was the pianist. Neither had ever been late for their choir practice. In fact, they always arrived 15 minutes early. And just as a by the way, thank you very much, Linda, for playing the piano before the service even started today. It was great to be able to have some live music here this morning. So at 7 o'clock on the Wednesday night, March 1st, 1950, 1950, this is a true story. The choir practice always begins at 7.30 p.m. on Wednesday night. Mrs. Paul calls to her daughter upstairs and tells her that it's 7 o'clock, you need to get ready, we have to get there, we have to leave in just a couple of minutes. But there's no answer. So Mrs. Paul finishes up a few of the things that she's doing, and she goes upstairs to get her doctor, and she fi- daughter, and she finds out that her daughter is fast asleep. So she wakes her up, now they're getting late, it's already quarter after, 20 after, they're always 15 minutes early, but they are now going to be late for sure. So they, they, uh, they hurry around the house, they leave about 25 after, they're not going to be able to get there to the choir practice, the ones who never miss the choir practice, they're not going to be able to get there until at least 25 to 8 or 20 to 8. And so they're going to be late for the first time. So what would the rest of the choir think about the choir director and the pianist being late? Well, it's interesting because there are 18 choir members. And they won't be making it to church by 7.30 either. But they'll be hoping to get there soon after. Tonight is an odd night. Not only is the choir director and the, and the pianist having a problem, but all the others are facing some problems as well. Donna is a high school student. She's having trouble with her homework, and she's been working on this problem, and she needs to get it done. She wants to get it done before the choir practice starts. So she ends up working until 25 after 7, and it's a 10-minute drive. She's not going to get there, but it's going to be late. She's going to be there ten minute, 5 or 10 minutes late. Rowena and her sister Heidi are heading out to uh, find that here in this March night their battery has died and uh, they can't go, their, their car is dead, and so they call up Donna, the one doing the homework, uh, to get a ride, and of course she's doing her homework, so she says, I'll pick you up, but we're all going to be late. Mrs. Schuster is always 10 minutes early for the practice. But she's been slowed down because she's helping her mom prepare for a missions committee meeting that's taking place after the, after the, after the choir practice is over. And so they're going to be five or ten minutes late. Herb was at home finishing up a letter that he had been putting off for a long time, and he had to get it done. So he finishes up his letter, but he finds out that by the time he's finished, it's 25 after 7, so he makes a rush to get over to the, to the, to the uh, church. But again, he's going to be at least 10, maybe even 15 minutes late. Then there's Joyce, who wanted to stay in the warm house for as long as she possibly could, so she knew she was going to be late. She decided, I'm going to leave at 25 after. I'm going to get there at 25 too. And they won't have started probably right on time anyway, so I'll get there a few minutes late. Harvey is at home babysitting the kids. His wife is out of town. He's waiting for the babysitter to show up, and needless to say, the babysitter is late. So he is going to be late for the choir practice as well. Two more girls, high school girls, Lucy and Dorothy. They've started listening to a really interesting radio program. Now, back at this time, of course, there wasn't TV that they were watching, not even black and white so much. So they were listening to a radio program, a half-hour program that started at 7 o'clock. They just couldn't tear their, set themselves away from the uh, radio program, and so they listened right through till 7.30, then they made a beeline over to the church, and they were going to be late. And then there's the pastor and his wife, who also were in the choir. And uh, he didn't know it, but his, t- his watch had lost 10 minutes of time. And so uh, he, ended up, he ended up being uh, not on time at all. He was automatically going to be 10 minutes late. He didn't even know he was going to be late. He thought he was going to be all the t- on time. All the rest of the choir members all had reasons or excuses for being late. The first time in the history of this choir that it had ever happened, 18 choir members, 18 people late for the 7.30 choir practice. When 7.30 came, the church was in absolute darkness. At 7.31, the furnace kicked in, 
and the church exploded into splinters and rubble because of an undetected gas leak. Tonight, God had choreographed things to happen without anybody being hurt. It's a true story. Tonight, the frustrations that everybody felt in being late would turn to joy because their lives had now been spared. Tonight, their disheartenment turned to thankfulness as they saw things from God's perspective and were more than happy with how God had worked things out in their lives. As we take a look at Mark chapter 8 today, we'll hear some things that we would find hard to listen to if we had been a disciple. Jesus will outline some things that at first we would not be happy with, at first. But with time and God's insight, we would realize that he really did know what was best. You remember that old TV show, those of you who are maybe my age or a little bit younger, Father Knows Best on TV, Father Knows Best? Well, it's one of those things that we can say with assuredness, our Father, the Lord, knows best. Our Father knows best. In our own lives, are we willing to adjust our desires to God's desires as he ends up meandering us through life in ways that we probably didn't expect? Well, I'd like to share some points with you that each start with the letter D. I was trying to figure out how can I make up an outline for this or how can I create an outline. So I came up with the letter D as the one. Each one basically starts with the letter D. So Mark chapter 8, verses 27 through to nine, chapter 9, verse 1. Remember, the chapters were added in later in the, in the scriptures. So that even though we're going into the first verse of chapter 9, it really is combined together with the rest of the uh, chapter 8 as well. So... You don't always have to adhere to, well, this is where the chapter ends, that's where, that's where the story ends, we start a new story. No, it's a continuation. So we're looking at Mark chapter 8, we're only going to read through these four verses at the beginning, then we'll carry on as we're going through the other D points that I'm making. Mark chapter 8, verse 27 to 30, it's decision time, decision time. Let me read for you in chapter 8, verse 27. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist. And others say, Elijah. And others, one of the prophets. The Gospel of Matthew includes the, the, the name Jeremiah in this as well. Verse 29. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. Again, Matthew's account adds in, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he, Jesus, strictly charged them to tell no one about him. Jesus and his disciples have traveled about 40 kilometers northeast from the, from the Sea of Galilee up to the area of Caesarea Philippi. You can see it on the map there, up in the top right corner. You get Mount Hermon just a little bit further south than that, that Caesarea Philippi. And it says that they've gone into the area, the villages around the area of Caesarea Philippi. It's not far from Mount Hermon. The peaks of Mount Hermon are covered in snow. Uh, basically all year long they rise to about uh, 9,000 feet. The waters that flow from here form the, uh, from the mountain form the majority of what flows into the Jordan River and then of course south and then down ends up in the Dead Sea. This is an area also that is known for worship of the god Pan, the half goat, half man. And uh, Helen and I, when we were actually over in Israel back in 2006 or 2007, went to visit this site, uh, the site that you can see here. Uh, we went to visit it and worshiping Pan. Well, it's also an area that most believe that Jesus travels in Mark 9 with the Mount Hermon area, where Peter and James and John go up into the mountain and his glory is displayed to them in all of its brilliance. It's called the Mountain of Transfiguration. We'll touch on that a little bit later in the sermon. So Jesus is asking his disciples, and the, the word here when he asks, it's not just a one-time ask. He asks. He's asking a few times. And he says, first of all, who do people say that I am? And then he asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? People are saying that he might be John the Baptist, resurrected from life after, his li after his life had been taken. Some say that he was Elijah, because Elijah was supposed to be preceding the, the, uh, the Messiah before he came as the great victor, as the Jews had said. Others say that he's one of the Old Testament prophets. Maybe it's Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. But then Jesus says to them, well, who do you say that I am? The whole first half of the Gospel of Mark has been leading up to this point. 
What kind of Messiah is Jesus and what does it mean to follow him? What kind of Messiah is Jesus and what does it mean to follow him? Everything has been taking place basically around the Sea of Galilee, north of Galilee and that. That's for the first two years of his ministry, basically. Now the last year of his ministry that we're moving into, the last half of, of the book of Mark, will be moving down and into the area around Jerusalem. What has been, what Jesus has said to them, and, and don't tell anybody, and don't tell anybody when they've been healed and that sort of stuff, is that it's not, he doesn't want that to be out and around yet as to who he is. When they get down to the Jerusalem area, when they get down into that area of uh, where all the, more of the religious leaders are in that, now it becomes more open. Now it becomes more, more well known in this last year of his life. So the first half of the gospel has, excuse me, has happened. Now we're moving to the second half of the gospel of Mark. That question, who do you say that I am, is still asked today. How we answer it determines our course in life. How we answer it determines our priorities in life as well. How we answer it determines who our closest friends are going to be and who our closest friends are not going to be. How we answer that question, who do you say that I am, to, in regards to Jesus, will answer the question as to what kind of person we will marry and how we will raise our children if we're blessed to have children. We'll also see the answer, the answer will determine where our eternity will be spent. Who do you say that I am? People say that Jesus was a good man, a great teacher, a Jewish rebel even. If you Google that question, which I did, you'll find different answers. I found a Barna survey that's done down in the United States back in 2015, and I'll abbreviate what I have in my notes here, but Jesus is, is thought by many to be, a, a, for sure, like 95% uh, of, of main adults, people who are 35 and older, and, uh, and those who are younger, the millennials, uh, born in between 1984, I think it is, or 1981 and 2000, are, are counted as millennials, about 85% of them believe that Jesus was an actual historical figure. So he was historical. But was Jesus God is the other question that was asked by the Barner survey. Well, about half of the adults over 35 say that Jesus was God, and about 25% they say he was only a religious leader, just the same as Muhammad was or as Buddha was. 18% so they say they don't even know. And then those who are under the millennials, they say about 25% say that he was really just a religious leader as well. And then across all age groups, 50% believe that Jesus was human, but that he also committed sins just like we do. He also committed the sins. So he was really not a whole lot different than you and I. And yet many of them have made a commitment to Jesus as a first step towards Christianity. It's also interesting that they found that the more money people made the less likely they were to become a Christian. And, uh, of course, that's, uh, that was uh, echoed by Jesus later on, where he says it's easier for a, for a rich man to, to, to go through the eye of a needle than it is for, uh, for him to enter heaven. Because there are all sorts of cares, there are all sorts of things that go on in a person's life that can distract them, all of us. People were conflicted between Jesus and good deeds as the way to get to heaven. 65% said that they'd made a personal commitment to Jesus in this Barna survey down in the States, and that, that when, they got, when they die, they will go to heaven, but many of them believe that it was only going to because, be because of their, of their good works that they were going to get there. When the survey concluded, the conclusion was this. They said, there isn't much argument about whether Jesus Christ actually was an historical figure, but nearly everything else about his life generates enormous and sometimes bitter debate. To be honest, I'd say that the statistics in Canada would even be lower than they are down in the United States. We have an idea where North America stands when it comes to answering the question, who do you say that I am? Peter answers on behalf of himself, and I think the rest of the disciples as well. He says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He uses that word Christ, which is the same word when you're looking at it in Hebrew, you're looking at it in Greek, the anointed one, the, the Messiah. The decision has been made. Jesus is the Savior who was predicted to come into the world and forgive sin. Jesus is that Lamb of God that John the Baptist had said beforehand, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. 
Jesus is the one who created all things and how all things continue to exist. Peter, Peter is exclaiming on behalf of the disciples and himself. Jesus is the one who will one day spend, we will one day spend eternity with or forever separated from because of our faith or lack of faith in who he is and what he's done. But the question for each person in this room and each person that's watching online is who do you say that I am? We can't be constantly vacillating between whether he's who he said he was and who the world says he was. We have to come to a decision. We have to make that decision personally. No one can make it for us. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. At Christmas time, we read from Matthew chapter 1, it says, The virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. In Mark chapter 2, verses 5 through 7, Jesus says to the paralytic man that he's just healed, but that he's also going to heal spiritually, he says, your sins are forgiven, something that only God can do. In John chapter 5, 18, it says, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill Jesus because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So the Jewish people recognized who Jesus said he was saying he was. They rec recognized he was saying he was equal with God. Will we believe what the Bible says, or will we believe what perhaps philosophers and people all around us might say, if they're saying anything at all? Who do you say I am? A decision needs to be made, because each of our eternities depends on it. The second thing is disheartenment. Disheartenment. You look in verses 31 through 33. Following the decision that has been made by Peter and the rest of the disciples, we read these words in verse 31. And he, that's Jesus, began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he, that's Jesus, Jesus said this plainly. There wasn't any doubt in their minds. He said it plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Can you imagine? He took him aside. And this is, this, this word, and I'll, I'll finish up in a second, but just as a sideline, when it, the words that are used here means that when he takes him aside, he, he, it's like he grabs him by the arm and takes him over to the side and he, he, gets, he, he gets his face looking right at Jesus' face. It's, it's like face to face, he says, and, and then he starts to, to rebuke Jesus for what Jesus has just said. Can you imagine? And so he says he took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning Jesus, Jesus turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Jesus tells them clearly and he tells them plainly what is going to happen during the course of the next year as they leave from here and head south towards Jerusalem. Jesus doesn't say the word might happen, but the Greek word that is used here says the Son of Man must suffer these things. It means it's a foregone conclusion, it's absolutely determined, it's written in stone, it's dyed in the, dyed in the wool, it won't be changed, the Son of Man must suffer these things. That's what the Greek word means. And it's going to be not a nice, a nice story. It's going to be disheartening for these disciples. It's not what they thought would happen. They had been taught all the way through as they had been growing up in their faith. They had been taught that when the Messiah comes, he is going to free us physically, free us from the bonds of whoever is over us, and it had been the Romans for many, many years at this point. He's going to free us from the bonds of the Romans and he is going to, to, to free us once and for all, and he is going to rule over us as the Messiah, and we will be free to worship him, and the Roman oppression will be gone. This anointed one would ride into, into Jerusalem as the triumphant leader and crush the soldiers and bring victory to the Jews once and for all. That's what they've been taught. And Jesus actually does ride into Jerusalem, as you know from having read the scripture in the past, and he is hailed as the Messiah a week before he is actually put on the cross. 
They actually, people are there and they put down their cloaks in front of the little donkey that he is riding on and they put the, the palm leaves down in front so that he can, it can be going. This is the tribute to a king, a coming king, a coming victor, a coming conquer, conqueror. And that's what actually happens. But Jesus was bringing a victory over sin through his death on the cross. Not a physical victory over the Roman government. As soon as the disciples have been told plainly by Jesus what's going to happen, they are disheartened. This is not what they were expecting. This isn't the direction in which they thought that things were supposed to go and that they, they, they were not happy about. They're disheartened, they're upset, and they're maybe on the verge of even being angry, as Peter evidenced a little bit when he took Jesus aside to rebuke him. The question is, has that ever been a reaction of you and me? That anger? That upsetness, this heartedness, when things don't turn out the way that we want them to? Have we ever gotten upset for, at God for not answering our prayers the way that we had hoped or the way we expected Him to? Have we ever gotten angry and even maybe raised a fist at what we thought was an injustice that God did not correct? Have we ever reacted like Peter did? Have we ever been rebuked for our reaction? as Peter was by Jesus. And Peter took Jesus aside, began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. And then he gives a reason. He says, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Peter is about to get more than he bargained for when Jesus tells him that he's saying things that are trying to thwart God's plans. When Jesus was tempted by Satan at the start of his ministry two years before this, Satan tried to promise things that he had no right promising, which would short-circuit God's plans. And that's what Satan does in all of our lives. Always promises more than he'll ever deliver, and makes promises that he'll never plan on keeping, saying that things will be this way when they end up being that way. It's just the modus operandi that, 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 uh, that Satan uses. He's a liar. He's the father of all lies. He's been a liar from the beginning. And so Jesus answered Satan back then with the same words as he says to Peter now, get behind me, Satan. Satan, Peter has become the, 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 the spokesman for the disciples and saying, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And within minutes, he's, he's, he's being told to get behind Jesus because he's calling him Satan, because he's being the, the voice for Satan and trying to thwart God's plans. But Jesus adds that explanation that helps clarify what Peter and the disciples are feeling. You are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. I think it probably happens when we get a disheartened feeling, when we get upset, that, uh, that things aren't going the way that we really wanted them to, the things that we had prayed about, the things that we had hoped that God would do, that perhaps one of the reasons is we were setting our hearts on the things of man and not of God. Because part of setting our hearts and minds on the things of God, having that, that Christ mindset, that mind of Christ, is that we are willing to go and maneuver, be maneuvered through life as God sees fit. Being willing to accommodate, be willing to follow. That's part of what, that's part of what following Jesus as a master, as the rabbi is, is that we accompany him along the way. And where he goes, we go. And what, what he is wanting to teach us, we are trying to learn. That we're not trying to instill in him our will, but rather we are waiting for his will to be instilled in us. Even the, even the Lord's Prayer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right? We, want, we ought to be praying for in our own lives, as well as in this world, that God's will would be done in this world the same as it come, is carried out in heaven. When you and I get started disheartened and upset and angry and want to rebuke God for what's happening. We need to check our motivation and if our focus is on the tree or if it's on the forest. If it's on the immediate picture or if it's on the big picture. If it's on our will or if it's on God's will. If it's on the temporary or if it's on eternal things. What does Jesus say the answer to the question is? Where does he say we should turn? How can we prevent the ta taking the same wrong turn again and again? He answers that in verse 34, and that's denial of self. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me.
The word deny here brings the meaning of to forget oneself and to lose sight of one's personal interests. Luke's gospel adds the word daily after the word Christ. Let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. The word cross was, a, was, was an automatic referral to the, to the death that Romans gave to not any Roman citizens, but to others who had transgressed them, dying on the cross. Once we've placed our faith in Christ to be saved, we need to continue to place our faith in Christ daily to lead us, even when things aren't going in the direction that we kind of think they should be going in. The words follow me mean to take the same road as another does and to accompany, to fellowship, uh, fellowship with and learn from the other person moment by moment along the way. That's what the word follow me means. We are to follow or emulate or copy or think like or take on the same mindset as that person that we are following. There was an article in the Ottawa Citizen, the newspaper up in Ottawa, Ontario, back in the year, back in the year 2001. And it, re it, it reads this way. Can you imagine working for a company that has a little more than 300 employees and has the following statistics? 30 of them have been, accu been accused of spousal abuse. Nine of them have been arrested for fraud. 14 of your 300 employees have been accused of writing bad checks. 95 of them have been directly or indirectly bankrupted, at least in two businesses. Four of them have done time in jail for assault. Fifty-five of the 300 employees can't get a credit card due to their bad credit. Twelve of them have been arrested on drug-related charges. Four have been arrested for shoplifting. Sixteen are currently defendants in lawsuits. Sixty-two have been arrested from drunk driving by, for, for drunk driving in the last year. Now, Pat, you're a businessman. If you had this many employees that were like this, <laughs> some of you others as well. Well, can you imagine who the employer is, the employment agency is? The 301 MPs in the Canadian Parliament. That's back in 2001. Things have changed dramatically now, I'm sure. The same groom that we look to as being the example of what the rest of us are to be like as law-abiding citizens of Canada. Would we want to be following those examples? No. We are to be followers of Christ's example. Not the people in this world around us, not people that are up in Parliament. We need to be follow, focused on, focused, laser focused on, following Jesus Christ as our example. It's not the kind of lifestyle that Jesus is calling to. It's far greater and far higher than anything that this world can ever set out. Our self-denial comes through following Jesus daily. We daily say no to self and yes to the Savior. We daily, say, uh, we, we daily determine to follow His wisdom and not just ours or those that are around us only. We daily say yes to the gospel and God's word. One commentary I looked at summarized discipleship as this. Making the decision to become a disciple, giving up our autonomy and making ourself accountable to God, and then finding our identity in Christ and not ourselves. This point reminds me of the old hymn written back in 1936 by Benjamin McKinney called Wherever He Leads I'll Go. Let me read three verses since we're not singing. It says, Take up thy cross and follow me. I heard my master say, I give my life to ransom thee. Surrender your all today. It may be through the shadows dim or o'er the stormy sea, I take the cross and follow him where'er he leadeth me. My heart, my life, my all I bring to Christ who loves me so. He is my master, Lord and King. Where'er he leads, I'll go. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Wherever he leads, I'll go. I'll follow my Christ who loves me so. Wherever he leads, I'll go. We've looked at the decision time, the disheartenment, the denial of self. We move to the death of life, the death or life. Verses 35 to 37. For whoever shall save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? For what can a man give in return for his life? 
The Greek word life here is not just talking about our physical being. It's talking, talking about our suke. That's the word that's used. And it, it, it talks about our, who we are, our soul. It talks about our, our will and our thoughts and emotions, our reasoning, our, 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 our personality. To follow self brings death while following Christ brings life. This is Jesus' philosophy of life, so to speak. The word, word, the word world doesn't refer to the world that is the physically around us. It's talking about the cosmos, the whole world system. The world that we see, but also the whole world system that is around us. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 says, The God of this world, the God of this world, has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. That's the, that's the, the, the deportment of the, the philosophy of this world around us. It's not to follow Christ, it's to not follow Christ. It's not to follow Christ, it's to not follow Christ. I heard one person say, a person can spend his entire life climbing the corporate ladder only to find out at the end of their life that it was leaning against the wrong wall. What are the pursuits of our life? What are we living to accomplish? What are your goals and my goals in life? What if we became the richest person in Canada but died without Christ? Where would we be for the rest of eternity? That was something else I googled as well. Who are the richest people and how much are they worth in Canada? The richest person in Canada, do you know how much he's worth? His name is David Thompson. He's the chairman of Thompson Reuters. Do you know how much he's worth? $39 billion. B with a, with a B, billion. I was trying to imagine what $39 billion looks like. I can't. <laughs> I can't. All I could think of is, well, if I was to give a million dollars to a thousand people, you know, that's what, two and a half years or so, if I gave a million dollars to one person every day for two and a half years, that would be one billion dollars. So then you multiply that by 39 and you get 39 billion. I mean, it's just unfathomable to me. 39 billion, that's the richest man as of last year in Canada. The second richest man in Canada is, is worth, it's a big drop from 39 billion down to 10 billion. That's the next person in line. And he's, uh, he's the vice chairman of the Chinese e-commerce e giant Alibaba Group. He's worth 10 million. And then Gail Weston, you've seen him on TV through, the, through Loblaws and that. Gail Weston of Loblaws Renown is worth 9 billion. And it goes from there down to one. So 41 altogether. First one's 39 billion, and then it goes down to 10 billion. Then the other, basically 40, are between 10 and, and and 1 billion. Well, everyone in this world will breathe their last and go into eternity one day, with or without Christ. What is your life, and what is my life focused on? Is it gaining wealth? Will these people be closer to heaven? Not. They're not going to be. In fact, I would say they're further from being able to become a Christian because of that verse that Jesus said. It's harder for a, a rich man to go through, or the rich man to be saved than it is for a, a camel to go through the eye of a needle. That's from Mark chapter 10, only two chapters later from what we're reading. There are so many more cares and distractions and temptations that people who pursue wealth have that it leaves little room for the gospel. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? lose his own soul. Jesus says that we should give our life to Jesus and the gospel to really understand what life is all about in this world as well as the world to come. So the question I ask is, that has been asked at the beginning, who do you say Jesus is? And then what is your pursuit in life? What is your pursuit in life and what is mine? We come to the last thing, the last thing. The days ahead, the days ahead. We start in verse 38. For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come to power. Theologians, theologians have not agreed on exactly what these verses are referring to. Just Jesus referred to the transfiguration, which is going to be happening in chapter 9, just a few verses, just a few days after what they're doing right now. They go up into that mountain. There's the transfiguration. Pastor Jeremy will be talking about that next week. 
So is this referring to the transfiguration? Is it referring to the resurrection of Jesus after in a year's time? Is it referring to the, the great day of Pentecost, which is a year, uh, a year from now plus the 50 days after his resurrection? Is it referring to the destruction of Jerusalem that happened in 70 AD? Or is it, is it referring to the second coming of Jesus when he comes back? It's not happened yet. When he comes back and he comes with all of his angels. And it's, it's, uh, it's the, like payday has come, so to speak. It's the final day. They can't agree. They can't agree completely. And some have, some have said this, and I agree with, with this, and I, I believe that this is probably the case, and so this is my opinion because I'm in the company of many people wiser than I, but my opinion is that it's actually referring to two times. Mark chapter 8 and verse 38 is referring to the second coming of Christ with his angels when there will be judgment. Matthew chapter 16 verse 27 is a parallel passage to this. And it adds another de detail. It says in Matthew 16, 27, For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he'll repay each person according to what he's done. I think that's still the future. That's what's going to be happening in the future when Christ comes back with his angels and repays each, porting, each person according to what he's done. That's the judgment. It's a refer re reference to what the individual has done regarding trusting or not trusting him and whether he's been good or bad, so to speak. No, it's what he's done with Christ. Other scripture passages make it crystal clear that we are saved by faith, for we are saved by faith, by grace, and through faith, not of ourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. So we are saved through faith. So when Christ comes back, that's when the repayment, he says he will repay each person according to what he's done. But I believe that in Mark chapter 9, verse 1, is referring to a time that's much closer when it says this, Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not, see, who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. So, obviously, people that were there, the disciples in particular, were not going to be still living, except in glory, they're not going to be still living when Jesus comes back, that which is still in the future. So what could it be talking about? I believe that it's, it's talking about that day when Pentecost happens. It could be, the, uh, could be his resurrection. It could be both when he's talking about that. But when he is, he is, he is, he is, his life is taken on the cross, he rises, to, rises again three days later, and then he comes back to life, and for the next 50 days he's on earth, and he's seen by hundreds of people. He does a multitude of, 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 of miracles, proofs of his resurrection from the dead. And then he goes to glory. And that's what I believe that it's referring to. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come in power. And remember, right after that, that's when Peter preached. Again, Peter, the same one. Peter preached, and there were 3,000 people that, that claimed Christ as their own on that day. And then there are multitudes of people that were saved after that. That was the power of God. Do you remember the, 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 the evidence of the Holy Spirit entering into people on that day? And there was that great wind. There was that great, there was that great noise. There was that great power that was displayed on that day of Pentecost. From this point on, Jesus and his disciples... Now go to Jerusalem and basically stay there until Christ is crucified, buried, resurrected three days later, seen by hundreds of people, and then returns to heaven after 50 days. That's when people evidence the kingdom of God. Most people would not die within that next year, and they will see the power of Pentecost in the present and the presence of the Holy Spirit. There will be miracles being performed, as I mentioned. The disciples would live to see that day happen and preach about it for the rest of their lives. The point Jesus is making is that we are to stand true for our faith in Christ and not be ashamed of him. Stand true for our faith in Christ and not be ashamed in him. So what is our view of the Savior? Is it realistic? Is it true to Scripture? What is our decision? Well, what do you think? Who do you think I am? Who do we say that Jesus is? Are we disheartened when our prayers aren't answered in the way we want? Or do we feel rebuked or some pushback from other people? Are we denying self daily and yielding to God's will in our lives? Are we trying to gain the whole world and in the process lose our own soul? Or have we died to self and sought life through the Savior's forgiveness? 
The New Living Translation says in verse 35 and 36 says this, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? One way brings death, one way brings life. And we have the choice as to which one we will take. Will we choose life? Will we choose death? Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Jesus asks. Let's pray. Father, as we come to you in prayer, I ask, O oh Lord, that you would work within the hearts of each one of us. Father, as we answer that question in our own mind, even right now, if Jesus was to stand right in front of us and say, who do you say that I am? What would we answer? He was a good person, religious leader, very spiritual. Or would we say that he is Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the one who can forgive sin, the one in whom I need to place my faith and trust to forgive my sin. Would we say that? And if we do say that, how are we living to prove that? How is our life demonstrating what we say we believe? Are we truly living our life as Jesus would want us to? Are we pursuing the goals that he wants us to? I pray, O oh Lord, that you would help us to be pursuing your goals. That as we are following along with you, as we are walking along with you, as we are, are we, we are endeavoring to have our identity not in ourselves or in the things we can do, the things we can accomplish, the, 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 the work that we do, the, the, the accolades that we may get, may our, may our identity not be in those things because they can all be removed in an instant. But God, may our identity be in you. For you have saved us. We owe our all to you. Help us, God, to live that way, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless your friends. Thank you for being here today. Now, the ushers will come, and they'll be uh, ushering you out so that uh, you're not crossing each other in the, uh, in the uh, aisle here. And uh, just, uh, just wait for them to come, and they will, uh, they will take you.